off the recording. Welcome back, everyone. Our review session of the full stack of interactive visualization, whatever that means. What that means, we are going to cover in the next few minutes. I've shared this repository, my GitHub, this repository. Every visualization and full stack problem starts with a general topic of inquiry. What are one or a few questions that I have about some topic? In my case, I think language, data, poetry, lyrics are fascinating. What makes for a good combination of words over and above a bad combination of words. You can think about your favorite songs and you can think about you liking them more than the songs that you don't like because, because, because. So generally what makes for a good combination of words and on the other end, what would a bad combination of words be? Um, so from a computational perspective, that mandates the need for a data set. So Kaggle has been lovely enough to provide a set of lyrics. And that's what's going to be in this data folder. I just downloaded the Kaggle lyrics, um, have an entire review session from the last cohort talking about the cleanup process of loading the Kaggle provided data set into a cleaned version of it. Things like lowercase everything, remove punctuations, things that are not necessarily relevant to our interpretation of the words, but they are seen as different from a software perspective. So we want them to be the same. We want the lowest entropy possible in our data set. We want standardized, nice, normal, SQL ready data, which um, is right here. I cover the um, transform from a given data set to a cleaned data set. I also load it into a um, SQL database. We cover Postgres, load it in Postgres. I also put it into a NoSQL database. So we assume that we have some words table where I have words. I also used an API that I found, DataMuse API to grab all of the rhymes for each word. All of the rhymes, again, based on what the API said rhymes with the word, not necessarily what you or I say rhymes with the word. So covering the constraints of the tools given up until this point, things like eyebrow, maybe rhyme with puff, but um, peacocks and the idea of multiple words, just invest is just a word. Nobody really knows, but it rhymes with invest. So, um, we have about 200,000 of these. And the constraints of the tool are that we have things like multiple words are considered one. Shoe print rhymes with stint. That's the data set that we're dealt. And again, that process is covered um, in the previous review session of grabbing the Kaggle data. Um, splitting every unique word that is presented in the Kaggle lyrics data set, grabbing all the rhymes for each word and populating a NoSQL database. This could be Mongo, this could be any NoSQL database. I went with Dynamo um, just to keep everything under the AWS roof. Uh, it could be any NoSQL database. So we are starting at the point where we have a normalized data source. I can look up a word and I can get rhymes associated with that word. So that being said, what did I want to do with it? What I wanted to do was create a general multi-purpose tool, which is right here. I can use these GitHub pages, another thing we covered. Open link in new tab. Get a nice little fabric, favicon gives me this nice little icon right here. I wanted to just be able to put in words 
and get how many rhymes? Right away, I can tell that a lot more things rhyme with cat than rhyme with dog. I also wanted to live vicariously and amplify my um, dream of being Dr. Seuss and get all of the rhymes associated with each word. Uh, and we, we get that just by clicking an individual bar. Here are all the words that rhyme with dog, gulag, <laughs> hot dog, and again, accounting for the constraint or benefit of the tool that we're dealt. Um, also have a toggle for including multiple words, which we default um, to not including multiple words, but we can kind of explore what including um, multiple words in the response would actually look like. So here was the end product. What I actually wanted to build was just a visual representation of the quantity of relative rhymes found with each word. So how do I actually do that from a coding perspective? We have two components that are between the database and me as a human trying to grab things from that database and present them in a visually pleasing, interactive, intuitive way. I have a front end and I have an API because the entire software workflow is going to be human, talking to a front end, HTML, talking to a back end, our case is gonna be Python. We're gonna talk about a lot of Python review today. Hopefully we can use this as a opportunity to reiterate all of the fun, nice parts about Python that people might've forgotten and implying that that Python backend can actually talk to and uh, query the database that we know we have up and running. So let's standardize based on what response is gonna be passed back and forth between the front end and the back end. So the two files I really wanna to highlight today is gonna to be our front end, our index HTML with a grand total of zero CSS, as you can tell, very unstyled. Leave this to you and your imagination to make this as pretty or repurpose as uh, deeply as you'd like. As of now, there is no CSS. It is just index HTML and we have a handling function. So we're talking about in front end as index HTML that I can present as a web page. GitHub pages makes this very trivial to give myself a URL to present any HTML. And that front end has the ability to talk to a back end. And that back end has the ability to talk to a database and complete the chain of person to front end to back end to database pendulum swing of information flow. So you can go into the two files that I have available. My front end, index HTML, and my back end lambda function dot pi. What I wanted on this end, I have a nice little favicon, nice little icon, have a title, and I use our lovely Plotly for the requirement of using a third-party library. Also way easier than coding any of this stuff in raw JavaScript. I just wanted to grab words and an array of words that rhyme with that word and generate histograms from our API input. And to get front end input into a form that an API can digest it, we need some things like input to actually grab the words in. And I wanted a checkbox to be able to include or exclude multiple words because words that rhyme with uh, multiple words seem to include that word itself in the rhyme. Dog rhymes with hot dog, obviously. Um, so I wanted that on the front end as a toggle capability. Zero CSS in this entire thing. If people wanted to style it, we would just add, um, add some style up here in the head. But I'll leave that up to anybody that wants to. We have to have a URL. 
that is where our data is going to come from. That is our address to request data and be able to return it to the front end. We'll look at the code behind this as well. If we can think about this in a Flask perspective, I would title today as Beyond Flask. What is a serverless way to provide data to a front end? And we can think about Flask being fantastic if we want our API available 24 seven on all the time. That has obvious performance benefits for applications that are going to have 24 seven usage like Netflix has somebody requesting information at every minute of the day. It's big enough where it has people all the time. You're in my visualization app probably doesn't have people every second of the day requesting. We only need a response just in time to actually drive the users that are actually gonna be requesting our app to feed them a response just in time. So we're gonna show a serverless type way, which hosted on Amazon AWS. Again, serverless is a framework every big cloud provider um, has an offering. Amazon is gonna call it Lambda. Microsoft Azure is going to call it functions, but the idea is that a backend function can be one-to-one -one with a URL that is provided by that hardware broker. So I can rent some hardware, I can put a function on it, and I can make it available to the internet for anybody to be able to uh, request. And it spins up and it does my processing, everything that Flask could do just in time. And so we'll get into the Python of what actually handles this on the other end. But moral of the story is I wanted to uh, split um, words on commas. Basically, this just removes all the spaces. And um, I wanted this as a Boolean parameter. This returns true, true or false if that checkbox is checked. Remember that I can feed parameters to a URL like this. And I can build a URL to include multiple parameters with this ampersand. So I have two pieces of information on the front end that a user can dictate. Me as a user, I can specify a set of words to rhyme and yes or not yes to include the n grams. A single word is a one gram, hot dog would be two, a two gram. So this is common in language processing is the idea of an n gram. So multiple words together, three words in a row would be a three gram. So if I want to include the n-grams, I just append an additional parameter to my URL. And this is shorthand for get URL equals get URL plus, including that. And then fetch. That's my gateway to the internet in JavaScript speak. We remember d3.json, it's built on top of fetch. But the moral of the story is I can fetch some data. I can clear out anything that there was. Wanted to do this in raw JavaScript, just plain vanilla, no fancy external libraries, really go back to the basics, the fundamentals of what JavaScript is trying to do. I wanted to split the words in on commas because the front end specified that my words should be comma separated. That's a pretty fair, um, fair input comma separated values. We've seen that basically our whole life. And I had this JavaScript ternary operation where the rhymes are actually going to be used to build a bar chart. And what does a bar chart take? It takes 
a x categorical in this case, meaning a histogram of frequencies. And the rhymes are actually going to be the number of rhymes. So actually the length of the array returned. We'll pivot over to the back end and really standardize on the data returned and how the API actually builds that response. But as soon as I have our gold standard of visualization, this array, in this case, length one, because there's only one trace, but again, Plotly extends very nicely to multiple things on the same plot. And I could add a label and then I can Plotly new plot. I store the data returned in an API response. I initialize it to null up here outside of the function in order that I have a global memory of the API response. I do this only in order that I can bind a click event, plotly click. It's a nice built-in function. And we think about binding click events, plotly click. We can see very quickly that there are custom events available for us to handle. So I can generate a response to a user clicking on a bar by just selecting the viz and tethering a on plotly click event. And this is on the event. This again, did not have this memorized. This is just a snippet of code I found on the plotly documentation. And then I decided for my purposes, what I actually wanted to be in the response. So I found that Plotly handles click events like this. And then I decided that from a clicked bar, I wanted to know what word they clicked on. I wanted to check the most current API response for the array of rhymes that rhymed with that word. And then I wanted to build myself a message to actually add to my HTML. We've seen how to do this in a D3 way. I wanted to go back to the original JavaScript, plain vanilla, what is actually going on behind the scenes in updating individual elements that originally started blank. Here's my all rhymes div. It has nothing in it until my click decides something to be in it. I do that by building this message. How many words rhyme with the clicked word, new line, and then join my array by commas. But more importantly, and again, if there's any questions as we're going through, please just yell at me. Let's talk about myself as a user talking to the front end. Here's the front end I'm talking to very minimal HTML. There's all of the functional pieces of HTML that we actually have. 60 lines total, very light, very, very, very light. On the API side, let's see the Python that's actually making this data available. Again, hosted up in Lambda, I was very excited that multiple um, students actually also went the Lambda route. If you have a Flask app up and running, you can repurpose it very easily because what Lambda gives you is an event and a context parameter. And those are populated by an invocation of whatever invokes it. For this case, I decided to add a trigger. API Gateway is what actually builds me a URL. So API Gateway, create an API, just this easy. I wanna create a REST API and don't need anything additional, just create. It's just that easy. I'm not gonna do this because I have one already, 
but this is actually where our API endpoint is built from. So if I make a Git request to that endpoint, it will build a little container, a little spot in memory for this Lambda function to run and fire off the handler, which you configure specifically what handler do you want to handle the invocation of the URL. So if I know that I want my front end to pass in a comma separated um, list, one or more words to rhyme, I'm gonna code that as a W parameter. We saw that on the front end. And I'm gonna do all my security firewalling things at the top of my function. I'm gonna have the global resources available. This should look very similar to Flask. Bato lets me initialize a, a table object, which I can use in my function. This can be Mongo, it can be any database, it can be any external API. We can use all of our global references up top and then we can reference them within our function. This event comes with an HTTP method if it came from your browser like it should. I don't necessarily need this to be available for everyone everywhere. I just need it to be available to drive my visualization. So if the APA method is not Git, this is a browser specific thing. Sometimes your browser, depending on what browser you use, will actually send off an options pre-flight request. And that's a Google Chrome thing. Or a lot of browsers will send a pre-flight to say, hey, what methods and what uh, origins can this come from? So actually, because I'm using Chrome, I actually have to send it a pre-flight response back that says I can allow my site and I can allow these methods. If you're doing this on localhost or um, with a separate API, that's not necessarily a requirement, but Google Chrome is gonna send this pre-flight options request. But the important part is if it's not either of those, I can cut off my handling right at that point. I don't wanna be able to handle post requests. I don't wanna be able to handle put any of the other rest verbs, I don't wanna be able to handle those. I want my API to die right at that point, not even go any further. So if it is Git, that's where my API starts. That's where my functionality, what I was trying to do is actually going to begin. Remember I have these query string parameters and that's what I pass in with the W parameter and optionally the include ngram parameter. But here's where I do some validation. If I don't have parameters or W is not in my parameters, I can't process anything. It's a bad request. My API isn't gonna know what to do with it because it's not gonna have any words to actually query the database with. So I do my API validation at this point as well. And we can see that we actually have to format a valid URL query string that is actually representative of a user's desire. What they want to do needs to be encoded in that URL. So if we pass all of those checks, if it is actually a Git request, if it actually has a W parameter, then I could start to actually process that actually formatted request. And here's around the time where I'm happy to go as deep into the Python fundamentals, how Python is going to think about things, what the keywords in the language are actually representative of. Again, not params just means that whatever this was evaluated to false or null 
or an empty dictionary. Or if there is a parameter and the W key is not in them, this would, um, again, tell my front end that a W parameter would be required. Otherwise, here is all of the nice parts of Python and data handling and really processing a request. Very common convention in API design is to initialize a empty results object, in this case, a dictionary. And I'm gonna take my input. I know it's comma separated. If it's only one word, it'll just give me a list of one at this point, but I'm gonna take my parameters. I'm gonna take the W parameter out of that and going to split on commas. This gives me a words to rhyme list. And my favorite Python part about lists is I can iterate them. In my favorite Python syntax, I get so sad when I get away from the nice Python syntactic sugar. I can just write nice for loops. I don't have to worry about any of the JavaScript hieroglyphs, curly braces, semicolons, all that. I just can write a nice English for loop. For each word in my words to rhyme, I can iterate each of those words like this fashion. This line, hopefully everybody can stare at it and tell me exactly that they can do it in SQL, in Postgres, with SQL Alchemy, in Mongo. In whatever shiny new database comes out tomorrow, it definitely has the availability to execute this single line. No matter the syntax, every single database especially NoSQL ones are optimized for this single value lookup. I can take each word and I can get a single item out of my table. NoSQL is really optimized for those single value lookups. So we can get really good performance on individual lookups. We can also do this in SQL with a normal where clause. I can say select star from table where word equals my input word. And I can get a record out of that. That record at this point returns me a dictionary. If it has an item key in that dictionary, it means that it actually found a record for that. Is Dynamo speak for the record exist or didn't? SQL is going to return um, zero records or more than zero. And Mongo or any of the other databases you choose to use are going to be able to encode the amount of records in some way. So if item isn't in the word record, basically it didn't find a word for that, I am going to add that word to the results dictionary but I'm gonna say nothing, none, Python none, it means none, nothing was found. Otherwise, what it was actually built to do is check out what was actually found for the record. If my front end said that I should include engrams, and it actually encoded that correctly. Remember, equals yes came directly from my front end. Remember, include engrams equals yes is encoded as a key value pair as soon as it's passed to the back end. Then I can just get all off the rhyming words. Otherwise, I want to omit the ones that have a space in the word. Because hot dog rhyming with dog might be valid, 
but I might instead want to grab each word for the word in the rhyming words of this record only if a space wasn't in the word. That gives me only the one grant, so only the single pure rhymes with each word. And that's two ways to populate the same one namespace. Remember, namespaces are a big deal in Python. I wanna be really self-documenting about exactly what my code is doing. And I can do that with namespaces saying, these are the rhymes I found based on the parameters passed in by the user. And actually, instead of none, up here, I didn't find any rhymes. Now I can actually populate something useful to the front end. I pass back syllables. I don't necessarily use that, but I pass it back just for future if people want to do anything with the syllables. I have that as a record also. I cast it to an integer. I want to be very specific about what data types are passed back. And then also sorted is a nice built-in function in Python. I grab all of the rhymes that I found, either all of them or all of the pure single word rhymes, and I sort them. And then I JSON dump them into a JSON string, and that's what my front end actually can consume. So going back to my front end, we can see this optional parameter and the lack of alphabetical importance. You know, if I want to start telling a story about a cat and a dog at a zoo, maybe throw in a horse and another word that rhymes with randomly everything. I can hit my API with that. And I can get some relative frequencies about how much rhyme with each word. And I can blow through the datamuse 1000 rhyme limit. I can also check this box. And as soon as I fire off the same request, we can watch a whole lot more rhymes come back. 142 things rhyme with horse. Things like vaulting horse rhyme with horse. So that's maybe a detriment, but also things like vital force. So a vital force can change the course of my horse, of course. And I could be Dr. Seuss immediately. Even if I'm not talented by myself, I have automation to help me. Interactivity, cat, a look at. I'd love to present this to Dr. Seuss. I think he'd be so, so cool with it. <laughs> Thanks, Steve, calling me, <laughs> calling me vanilla ice. Yes, that is my dream. If this whole teaching math thing doesn't work out. I'm looking for my fallback plan right here. So that is my interactive visualization in a nutshell. As you can imagine, I had way too much fun playing with this. Really was indicative about the structure of the English language. I used it really just as a tool to get relative rhymes, but also what came out of it was what are the common endings in the English language. Remember just kind of cat and dog. A sanity check is just including the same suffix, if OG is a word. Sanity check, the same amount of words rhyme with cat as do with at. And with og as dog. 
So quick sanity check really was just indicative about the number of words that rhyme um, with each suffix and more generally the frequency distribution of the words in the country. And again, here's the one, one we went with right before. Definitely had too much fun with uh, each of these, but um, had a really back and forth. Do I sort these by alphabet? Do I sort them by syllables? Do I sort them by number of rhymes? Playing with all of those, said, no, I should sort them exactly how the user entered them because that is the most helpful to let me as a user actually match my input to what the visual is rendering. And that really is the core of everything. Visualization is creating something intuitive to map user input into an aesthetic way to tell the story surrounding the topic that they are asking about. So 40 minutes, that was my submission for project two and hopefully a fair overview of everything we have talked about in this course so far. I think front end interactivity, everything back end, Python fundamentals, data handling, everything database best practices. You can build some pretty cool stuff. Any questions about anything people are looking at at this point or would like me to go deeper into? Right, I see some chat coming in. <laughs> Reading the chat messages coming in. You guys are hilarious. That is the plan. Um, I'm going to 